webinar for um, accountants on um, the type of services uh, provided by ESS Biz Tools and which can be coordinated by ESS Biz Tools. We hope you're having a uh, very nice day and um, we look forward to delivering this special webinar to you. The guest presented today is uh, Trevor Marchant from Marchant Dallas and I'll be introducing Trevor to you in a moment. If during the webinar you have any questions, please don't uh, hesitate to type the question into your computer and in webinar jargon, raise your hand. Just to give you a bit of background on ESS Biz Tools, ESS Biz Tools has been operating for the past uh, 15 years and um, is committed to assisting accountants to meet the challenges that are in the marketplace. And you probably don't need me to tell you there are plenty of challenges at present. Our particular expertise is assisting accountants to provide a wider range of commercial services, generally known as business advisory services and we would welcome any inquiries that you might have on our products and services. What we would invite you to do is to uh, go to our website, essbiztools.com.au, and log on for a 30-day guest trial. We're also launching in next Tuesday a special website for small business, and one of the key aspects of the ESS small business website is going to be a find an accountant advisor directory, which will include accountants who are associated with ESS Biz Tools who are supplying uh, business advisory services. So if you need any further information on that, please don't hesitate to contact us. It's now my privilege to introduce you to Trevor Marchant. Trevor is a professional speaker, trainer and consultant and it's a senior partner of March in Dallas, an international training and consulting company based in Sydney. Trevor's a highly successful entrepreneur, having built four businesses, one of which is now a multi-million dollar turnover company. Trevor Marchin has worked with a number of the uh, ESS BizTools clients over the uh, accountancy firms, subscribers over the years, and with their uh, SME uh, clients. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Trevor Marchant uh, to this presentation today. And I'm just now transferring the presentation across to you, Trevor, and away you can go. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Peter. <clears throat> and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to share a few ideas with you this afternoon. Uh, I'll just start very quickly by positioning us. Um, basically, we help accountants and their clients reach the next level by showing them how to get the most out of everything they've already got, to stay focused on what re what's really important to grow your business exponentially, and to attract a consistent flow of quality clients. So, the positioning statement basically the two the two points of difference here, I guess, is one we work with you and your clients as opposed to other service providers, a lot of other service providers, and two, uh, our emphasis is on the how. You already know what you have to do. Sometimes it's a question of, well, how do you do it? Um, we have three basic service offerings. We have our Business Growth Masterclass Series, which is a 12-month program for accountants and clients involving a series of workshops and coaching sessions. And about 57 firms have now been through that, along with about 5,000 business clients. All up about 30,000 people have been through our programs, including this next one down, which is our two-day sales skills course, which is I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And the final offering there is a product called the Growth Factor, which is a simple, easy-to-use business consulting tool that any accountant on the planet can work with their business client and show them how to grow their business and at the same time make a couple of dollars. One of, the, uh, one of my past lives, I used to be the head of training for Westpac uh, back in the 80s and obviously from that you, know, you, we, you learn a lot of different models and ideas as to how to go best about training people. We used to use this little formula called cash 
um, and has a nice ring to it. But basically, um, the K stands for knowledge, A for attitude, S for skills, and H for habit. And the point I really want to make about this little model is that selling skills, which is what Peter's asked me to talk to you about, or professional selling, selling skills is, a, is, a, is something that you can't learn via a webinar or out of a book or out of an online course. Uh, selling skills is something you learn face to face with a master sales trainer and or in a classroom situation in a course. And once you've got some basics there, including you know the psychology of selling, the, the structure of the buy-sell process, how to ask questions in the right order, in the areas that you should ask them, once you've done all of that, then by all means, I would encourage you to go and read the books, go online, look at the courses, attend the webinars, because at least then you'll have a basic understanding of how things work. I probably read a book at least every other week on selling, so we're, we're always learning. But I just want to make the point that it is a skill and it needs to be taught in a face-to-face -face situation. Uh, I want to make a point about the A, which is for attitude. Um, I see that as what I call the multiplier. In other words, all things being equal, knowledge and skill, uh, attitude is the thing that takes you from mediocrity to greatness. Uh, it's it's the, the old glass, half full, half empty concept. And really, if you're going to get into this selling arena, and I'll give you some reasons why I think you should, uh, then attitude plays a really big part of it. Over time, as you practice your skills, like anything, including what you're doing now, you form habits. And it's habits that determine our future. So with that in mind, I'd just like to <clears throat> put some why, some context around sales training. Uh, some time ago, and I guess this is between, say, the Fraser and Howard governments, including Hawke and Keating in there, it was a pretty good time to be in business in Australia, in fact, all around the world. Um, people bought with abandoned. Uh, it was very consumer driven. In fact, the fish were almost jumping out of the water into the boat as using that as an analogy. And unfortunately, in 2001, a couple of aeroplanes flew into some buildings in New York and changed the world forever as we know it. And the concept, a key concept in selling is trust. And trust went out the window, uh, so to speak, and you know we've, we've never really recovered from that. And up until that point, a lot of businesses, particularly professional services business like accounting firms and the health industry and other businesses, architects, engineers, they really didn't have to market or sell their businesses you know, that strongly. I worked in the bank at the time and I know a lot of people used to just walk in the bank. Whereas these days now I'm finding more and more professional people having to go and market and sell their services. Um, we run this business growth masterclass, and we've got actually got doctors now in the program, and uh, you know they're selling various services like sleep apnea and cancer clinics and all sorts of things. So the world has certainly changed, and I guess you know you, you, you throw the GFC in the mix, and it is a little tougher out there now. People are less trusting, more discerning, better educated. They have the internet as their backup, so there there is a shift to more uh, looking at your business from a marketing and sales point of view. So that's the point of that slide. A couple of other key concepts in selling is that um, there are two business. Every business is two business. Think of your own firm or your clients. Uh, there are, there's the part that does the work and the part that sells the work. And most of us spend 70% of our time doing the work, and that's fine. That's how it should be. But if we don't sell the work, and let me say that uh, after having had 5,000 plus people through some of my programs and people not uh, you know, going on with their business, it's not so much, in my opinion, that businesses fail, it's just that people give up. And they give up for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is that they just get stuck not selling enough. And eventually we get a situation where we get lights out. So the business is closed and the dreams are dashed. Uh, it's not always because of financial issues. Often it's because of their marketing and selling. Another little concept 
that I use in selling is a lot of folks know how to make the thing they sell. In other words, we're good technicians. We're good at accounting. We're good at being a, a lawyer. We'd be good at all these sorts of things. We're trained. We have our qualifications and our experience. But we can't, don't necessarily know how to sell the thing we make. We sell up to a point, but when push comes to shove, we do need to understand uh, some basic technique when it comes to selling. And we talk about marketing. Uh, marketing, which is an extension of selling or precedes selling, but in my opinion, to be a really good marketer, you still need to understand the sales process, the psychology of selling and what goes into that. So a uh, couple of ideas there for you to have a think about as we progress. So Peter's asked me to talk about, <clears throat> I will go over a crash course in professional selling. Um, and that's all I can do is, is discuss it with you, talk it through with you, and give you some concepts, some ideas. Uh, but as mentioned, um, if, if it's a, a skill that you're looking to develop, then you'll need to talk to Peter about the two-day course that we run. And there's a couple of options for the, I'll talk to you about that in a moment. Firstly, let's just look at selling for a moment. The sale is defined by the client. In other words, we actually don't make sales. People say, you know, you, we need to make some more sales. Well, that's not actually quite right because it's the client that makes the sale. All we can do is create a set of circumstances in which a sale may take place simply by asking questions and, and walking the client through a process. But at the end of the day, uh, it's the client that makes the sales. And so our job as a professional or a master salesperson is to create that atmosphere. And I say master salesperson because if you're going to go into this, into this learn about selling, there is no point going in it you know, half, halfway. It, it's, it's, it's like being an accountant. You, you need to take this to a whole new level. And there is a... There is a skill involved. You know, salespeople are the highest paid people in the world. They're also the lowest paid people in the world. It just depends on how things are going and how they approach it. So it is a profession. Um, and I think accountants are already doing this. You're already selling. You may call it something else. And I think sometimes you beat yourself up a little that you don't, you know, you've never been trained in this area. Well, I think the basics are there. Uh, all you need now is, is a little bit of um, finishing off, so to speak, and I'm sure that that can be done. <clears throat> People, generally speaking, don't like to be sold, but they love to buy, and that's an important point in selling. Think about it from your own point of view. Uh, generally, we don't like to be sold. We walk into a retailer, we're looking at some product. We don't often like the pressure that comes from the salesperson but we do like to buy things. And when you think about selling from your point of view, we have a sense that we know that our clients need certain products. We say to them, you know, we think you need a self-managed super fund or we think you need to put in place a, a cash flow budget. Now, that's from our point of view, but from their point of view, they don't need that. In other words, uh, selling is, is more, from their point of view, is about want. So, the question then comes up, do people buy what they want or what they need? So what I'd like you to do just for uh, a few seconds is just jot down where you are, uh, say the last three, four, five things you've bought. Just take a few seconds to jot those things down uh, and just do that for me now, please. And then I'll, I'll get you to uh, put a symbol beside each one. Okay, so let's just have a look at that. Now, you may not have got one or two down, but maybe you've got some coffee, perhaps, you know, a CD, or you bought some milk, or you bought some petrol, or you had lunch, or bought some groceries, or you bought a golf stick, or a tennis racket, or something like that. It doesn't matter. The next part of the exercise is to write beside those an N for need, or a W for want. I'd like you to do that exercise for me now. Just put down a W for something that you wanted to buy and an N for something that you needed to buy. Now, I know that you all need coffee from time to time, but the truth of the matter is we probably wanted the coffee. Having done that, and you can continue this exercise later, what I'd really like to make the point is about this is this. 
there are some things that we need. What we need, and if you're a student of psychology, you might recall a guy called Abraham Maslow, who developed a pyramid of hierarchical needs. And what Mr. Maslow was saying is that we need food, shelter, warmth, clothing, air, water at a basic level. We need safety. We need a fence around us. We need some love. In other words, we need to interact with humans. Uh, we need to feel good about ourselves, self-esteem, and we need to make a contribution. We need to feel like we're actually contributing to a bigger picture. So there are our basic human needs. But when it comes to fulfilling those needs, we actually buy what we want. So if you're feeling hungry, for example, and that means the body needs some energy, so you need to put some food in there, you've got a choice. You can have an apple, you can have a, a, a can of Coke or a pizza, it doesn't matter. My point being is, as a seller, we feel that people need our things, our products and services. But as a buyer, we buy what we want. And that's the dilemma that we face in selling. Selling is a very emotional uh, exercise and what we have to do as salespeople, uh, professional salespeople, is find out what people want and why and then we talk to them about how we and our firm can help them get it. In fact, if we were to go through some of the major department stores in, um, in Australia, let's say we go through DJs or Meyer, and apart from bags and shoes ladies, there's nothing in those department stores that we actually need. Uh, they're all built on want. So have a think about that as we progress. Um, here's a definition for your selling. Selling is getting someone to do something they would not otherwise do. Now that isn't saying selling is getting somebody or convincing somebody to buy something they don't want. That's a different type of selling. That's peddling. That's the old snake oil approach to life. We're talking here about professional people selling professional services in a professional manner. So selling is getting someone to do something they would not otherwise have done. If they would otherwise have done it, they don't need you. So our job is to ask the questions and at some point persuade or suggest to people that they might like to try this idea or try that idea to solve a problem that they could be having. So that's the definition we're working on. <clears throat> In fact, selling, if we go a bit further, it's about giving, giving time, attention, counsel, education. It's about empathy. It's about leadership and value. Um, in fact, the, the word sell comes from an old English word called salan, which means, you guessed it, to give. It's a bit like if you're in a sales role, you're in a leadership role. You're in an educational role. If I'm uh, feeling hungry and I decide to walk across the street to Fred's pie shop and ask for a pie, I'm probably going to ask Fred which pie I should have. He's going to ask me some questions and he's going to recommend a pie. In other words, I'm looking to Fred for leadership. The same thing applies in our business, in the business of accounting or what other, other professional services. People are looking for leadership. So if you're in a sales role, you're in a leadership role because you're actually walking people through a process. But we need to know what this process is. One of the greatest salesmen in the world ever was Nelson Mandela. Think about this guy for a moment. You know, 26, 27 years incarcerated uh, for perhaps uh, he, where he shouldn't have been, uh, came out of there, still had a lot of forgiveness and love in his heart. And over a period of time, he actually managed to talk to some people, a ruling power, a white ruling power, to give up that rule and to take the whole nation to a general election where there was a shift in power, a massive change in power, and he became the president. So one heck of a sale made right there. And that's, in other words, what this he did was he suggested to people that they might do something that they would otherwise not have done. And there's no way they would have done that unless Nelson Mandela had the knowledge and the skills to take it forward. <clears throat> People, if they like you, and if they believe you, and they trust you, and they have confidence in you, then they may buy from you. 
The fortunate thing, the good fortune for accounting, for the accounting industry, generally speaking, is that, well, I should say the financial services industry, is that accountants are listed at the top. You know, in the overall scheme of businesses, pharmacists are regarded as the most trustworthy people in our market, pharmacists. Um, but if we look at financial services, it's accountants that are up the top. Uh, there was a time years ago, I know when bank managers were up there because I used to be in a bank, and uh, but that's changed now. So the good thing about that is that your clients and potential clients see that in you. Um, and they're the sorts of things that we need to continue to work on uh, from a sales point of view, making sure that they've got that. Also worth remembering that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. What you do is then the proof of why you do it. So what I really mean by this is, if we walk out your front door, look left and look right, <coughs> excuse me, there's probably a lot of accounting firms up and down Main Street, all selling similar products and services. So why would I choose you? The reason I would choose you is there's something about you that has attracted my attention to you. In other words, there's a point of difference in place. There's a why coming through. You've actually come through. You see, I'm going to buy from you if I believe in what you're doing, uh, if your passion comes through. So have a think about that. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. That's why it's critical in what we call a sea of sameness across the accounting industry to have some form of point of difference that you can actually, that you can drive your marketing with it, drive your referral programs with it, and drive uh, everything to do with you, your marketing and selling with it. So why is a concept, and it's probably the first one, the most powerful ones. I'm not sure whether you are readers or that you look, say, at the TED uh, videos, but there's a gentleman whose name is Simon Sinek. Now Simon wrote a book called um, Everything Starts With Why, and it's worth a read. Uh, you know, the first half is great, the second half not so sure. But the important thing is here is he's trying to establish why do you do what you do. And in selling, that's one of the first points that we come up with. Why, do we, why are we in this business of selling? Here's my purpose. My purpose is selling and so is to add value to people's lives by showing them or giving them a practical working solution to bridge the gap between what they have and what they want. The word add value probably is, is, I would probably change that a little bit now. It's more about bringing value to the, to the table. But if I take that concept into every selling situation, there is no situation I fear. Whether I'm talking to the managing director of uh, BHP Billiton or Fred over at the pie shop, it doesn't matter because I'm going into that uh, interview, that meeting, with this sole purpose in mind. If a sale happens, terrific. If it doesn't, that's fine. It's a matter of can I find out from these folks where they're up to, where they want to go, and do I have a product or service that might just help them bridge the gap. So really important that you have a think about why you're doing this selling in the first place, even why you're in business, perhaps. If you're interested in reading, uh, this little book here, I really recommend it. Um, you can get these, I get most of my books through booktopia.com.au, but there's plenty of other sources. This book here probably changed the way I think about selling about five or six years ago. Uh, I've always been in sales in one form or another and always been up in that top one, two, three percent. But this book has had a profound effect on the approach that I take, and I certainly teach this program. If you want a list of my top 10 books on selling, this is my list, just write to me and I'd gladly send you a list of books that you might want to have a read on. So now we get down to some ideas, some principles, if you like, of professional selling. Things that I pretty much uh, adhere to, or at least I'm always working to improve myself in this area. Firstly, start with your purpose, why you're doing this. Then I think you've got to get your attitude right. Um, goes back to the magnifier. You know, it's, it's, attitude is like energy. People pick up on your energy. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's working for you, people will pick up. If it's not working, they'll pick up on that as well. And that can make or break uh, a, cir a circumstance in which a sale could take place. So you've got to kick your own attitude. 
and, uh, and, and get that right, work on that all the time. We have to manage procrastination. Uh, we need to take lessons. I think lessons in time management, and there's a thousand of them out there, are pretty much a waste of time. Um, you know, reason, you know what to, you, you already know what you have to do, and you know when you have to do it by. So it's not a matter of, it is a matter of priorities, it is a matter of setting goals and having a to-do list, all those good things. But when it comes down to it, I think it's lessons in procrastination that we really need. Why are we putting things off? You know, do we need lessons in confidence with a circumstance or self-image or purpose or priorities? Uh, do we need a lesson in fear of, of, of being rejected by a client perhaps? Or a lesson in preparation, are we not preparing well enough for the client? But we, I think we need lessons in dealing with the things that you don't think you have time for, but in reality, we're just avoiding. Now, I'm not saying that's true of everybody. It certainly has been true of me from time to time. I don't think I have a time management issue. I have the same amount of time as you do. Some people get a lot more done in that time. I think the problem we face are the things that we keep putting off, and why are we putting them off? Are they important or not important? And I think that's the part that we have to address. And that's an important part of moving forward in selling looking at your procrastination. Um, we have to be prepared. Firstly, we do our research on the client. You know, if we're going into a situation, this is a new client or even an existing client, obviously it's smart to have information. We don't need to lay that out in front of the client, but we just need to have it in the back of our mind. It, it shows uh, integrity, it shows respect that we've actually done some work. And once again, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new here. The real research, though, is on yourself. You know, do you have the knowledge to move forward? Do you have the skill uh, to, to, whether it be a sales or a coaching situation? You know, how's your attitude? How is, how is the mindset? Are you ready to move from accountant to business advisor or coach? In other words, we have some accountants who often talk to us and say, look, one day I'm a I'm an accountant and tomorrow I'm a business advisor. How do I convey that to my client? It's really a question of all of those things, knowledge, skill and attitude. It's about being as opposed to uh, wanting. And it, it's learnable. It's just a, a question of understanding how things are shifting. The interesting thing about this, in my view, and Peter alluded to this, a lot of change in the accounting industry uh, some people probably beat it up and make it sound worse than what it is, but no doubt there is change when you look at cloud accounting, we look at perhaps some offshore processing and other things that are happening. But I think personally that's a good thing because what that does is free up, theoretically, it should free up some time. And in the end, I think you will process less and consult more. Now, if you're going to do more consultation, that puts you right in that business advisory space or business coaching or consulting space. So that means you need some products, ones that work, and you need to know how to position those products and how to sell those products and how to sell them to the benefit of the client. Uh, so that's where I think this whole industry is moving slowly, but that's where it's moving. We also, what else do we need to make this happen? What's, when we do our research on ourselves, what do we need and why do we need it? It's all about value. Um, I mentioned this adding value and it's hard to stop saying that, that phrase. But tr frankly, I think it's, it's not right because it's almost like we do a job and then we add some value. I have a different view and I, I, I'm, I'm teaching myself to say the right words, but it's, it's about being valuable, it's about perception. It's about you, the valuable person, and the value you bring to the table. We get paid according to the value we bring to the table. That's it. Um, your value is built in. It's what you do and say. Think about your training. Think about your experience, the years that you've been doing this. That's the real value. It's not something we add on at the end. We can provide other small services here and there. That's fine. But I don't see that as adding value. I think that's just service. That's just taking your service level to another level. Uh, you are the value in my opinion and value starts before the sale and doesn't stop after the sale. It's just who you are. Uh, it's, it's dealing with somebody who is valuable and sees themselves as a valued person. 
And if this penny can go down, if you can get this, eventually you will get away from these discussions around price and service and quality. And price will not be such an issue moving forward because people will see, clearly see the value. Um, I've said he stopped selling sugar. And what I mean by that is, is often in business, and I think there are some products and services you have that can be seen as commodities. And unfortunately, it is sort of moving that way a bit. Sugar is a commodity. We have to stop selling commodity. Um, we need to, in my opinion, look out who is our ideal client, what are the demographics and the psychographics of that, what specific challenges do they face in their words, not our words, but in their words. Who is your competition and what are their strengths? Uh, we don't want to know about their weaknesses. We're going to beat people on their strengths. Who are you co collectively and personally? What do your clients love about you? How are you stacking up by the measures your clients care about in areas your competition may be overlooking? They may not be doing business consulting or coaching, for example. So there's some areas there that we need to explore further and I guess get away a little bit from selling sugar. And we certainly need to learn to speak prospect. We need to start listening to what these folks have to say and trying to feed those sorts of words back to them. It's about relationships, as mentioned. Um, it's about finding out what people want and why. This one sentence here, I call it the one sentence sales course. Uh, we take two days to teach this uh, It's because it's about asking questions, it's about uh, asking questions in the right order, it's following a sequence and making sure that you cover all the bases. But this is a process which allows you to build strong relationships, relationships that will last forever. As you know, when you go into a, a, with a new client or an existing client, it's always about the long game. We've got to always be playing for that long game. Listen to them, summarise what we've got, develop a plan, get agreement, uh, list the action steps, who, what, when, how and why, and then implement and measure. So essentially that's a process that I try to follow, well I do follow, uh, with, our, with our relationship building. We need to understand their buying motives. Why do they buy and why don't they buy? It's important for you to ask this question when people buy from you. It's almost like saying thank you for the product, thank you for the service, thank you for being with us. Just remind me again why you chose us. We need to keep this information warm. We need to understand constantly why they're buying. People won't buy from you for four reasons. No need, no honey, <coughs> excuse me, no money and no trust. Trust is captain of the team. The first three are generally objections. It's a bit like saying, well, look, it sounds like a great idea, love to do that, but right now I've got some other priorities. Look, I'll get back to you in three months' time. So there we have a reason for not buying, going ahead, a no hurry, but it's largely an objection. And we can learn to deal with the no needs, hurries and money. We can, we can deal with them sometimes. But if there's no trust, then there's no deal. And constantly we have to keep working on building our trust. And that comes about by delivering on your promises and doing and going above all the time. It's almost like you do something and then some. So people buy from you to solve a problem uh, and that's ongoing. And problems always manifest themselves as feelings. It goes back to the want need thing again. If you're uh, you know, are feeling a little hungry at the moment for whatever reason, you, your, your body is saying you need some energy, it gives you a problem by give, sending you a, a pang of hunger and you sense that as a feeling. It's the same applies to everybody that's out there in the marketplace. All, all problems, in other words, where they are and where they want to be, eventually manifest as a feeling. That's why in selling, it has to, we have to get into that emotional side and ask the feeling type questions. They will buy you for those things on the right because they like you, they trust you. People will actually buy from you even though you might be a bit more expensive than the guy down the road, the girls down the road, because they like you and they trust you. All those things are very, very important. So, um, so we do under, need to understand their motives and motives change. That's why we need to keep doing these little mini surveys 
whether they be formal or whether they be informal, but we need to constantly find out why people are buying from us. Point number nine is always in selling, you have a purpose of selling, but you have goals in selling. In other words, you need to establish what your goals in selling are, whether they be increased turnover, X amount of dollars or whatever it might be, so many new clients, so many new clients with so many different products, that's up to you. But once you've worked those goals out, then look at those goals, the, the, the output of those goals from your business and from your selling as, as the energy or the fuel to make sure that you've got some personal goals in place. I'm a strong advocate for all clients and accounting clients to have goals in their health, their wealth, their personal wealth, their self in terms of growth, their relationships with their with their family, with their with their community, with their clients, etc. And also in the area of time. What do you really want to do with your time given the chance? So it's important to have some personal goals and then use your business or the output of your selling and all those good things that we do at work as the energy or the fuel to, to uh, succeed in that personal goal area. This is where there's an attempt at least to get some sort of balance going in your life. It's very difficult at times. I think it's a myth, work-life balance. I think life is a balancing act and it's okay sometimes to work 14 hours a day. Other times you just need to work a couple. So it just depends on the business I guess. Uh, point number 10, I've just listed as some laws. Um, there are laws in selling and the first law, it's a principle law, is that we all want to be happy. So everybody, unless you're coming from a completely different place, most folks want to be happy. So when they come to see you, they want to be happy but often when they come to see you, they're not happy because there's something going wrong in their life. There's a, there's a problem and that problem is a feeling and that feeling is affecting their happiness. The second law, happiness is relative. So what makes one person happy doesn't necessarily make the other person happy. So we need to gauge that. The third law is that resources are limited. Now simply because this company sees this as an issue and they're happy to fix it at this price, etc. in this way manner, doesn't mean the company next door to it will do the same thing because they have a different priority on different things and therefore resources uh, are, are viewed differently. So once again, it's always a question of asking questions. And the fourth law is that there must always be a profit exchange in any time we sell a product or a service. In other words, if I'm selling a motor vehicle to Peter Towers for $10,000 and Peter, Peter must value that motor vehicle uh, more than his $10,000 and I've got to value his $10,000 more than the motor vehicle. And if that is the case, then we're both going to walk away happy. <clears throat> Excuse me. If that's not the case, then someone's going to feel let down. So there's always got to be this profit exchange. And the final thing I'd say there is that um, we don't buy anything unless the product is a quality product. It's worth the money in our mind and that will do something for us that we want done. Now, the, what I call the myth busters. <clears throat> Over-enthusiasm over in selling is not necessarily a virtue. I think passion is. Passion for your product, passion for your business, passion for the client. But the last thing I want is an over-enthusiastic salesperson sitting in front of me because it often sends the wrong message. So just think about that. Uh, we need to be uh, passionate about what we do, otherwise we shouldn't be doing it. But enthusiasm sometimes can lead us down the wrong path. Sales success is not about convincing people, I said that before. You don't have to answer every, every objection. In fact, the salesperson that answers or tries to answer every objection is usually on a fairly low salary, a low commission, um, because it doesn't come across as sincere you're better off to say, great question, I have no idea, I'll get back to you. So that's okay. Quiet people will always outsell noisy people. I have coached and trained a lot of people over a period of time and uh, I know this for a fact. It's, it's often those folks that are just quiet, going about their business that will be the great salespeople. We don't need to be a smooth talker. 
that's uh, that's not not important, and we don't have to motivate people to buy. In fact, we can't. They motivate themselves. We just create circumstances in which a sale might take place. And finally, you don't have to reinvent your personality. I've often been uh, told, mentioned to me by accountants, and we've trained probably over two or three hundred now uh, accountants have been through their two-day course, where they say that you know they don't see themselves as a salesperson. <clears throat> I think you are. I know you are. It's just that you don't know that you haven't got the skills. And uh, well, in some cases you haven't got them. A lot of you already do have those skills. So it's just a matter of polishing them up. Uh, number 12, always ask for the business. Always be asking. If you feel you have done a good job with this client, new client or an existing client, doesn't matter, that ethically, morally, legally you've covered all the bases um, and that they are going to be far better off with this product or service than what they were before, then it's you have an obligation, in my opinion, to ask for the business. How you ask for it uh, needs some tact, it needs some coaching, uh, it needs some training, and we use some techniques called trial closes there, which, uh, which which help us because trial close only asks for opinion, it never asks for a decision, and based on the answer to the trial close, we know what to do next. The last point I want to make is that uh, it's what I call the sales paradox. When I stop trying to get what I want and start helping other people get what they want, I actually start getting what I want. Zig Ziglar, a mentor of mine, passed away recently. Uh, he was a quite a quite a trainer and sales person, uh, well re world renowned. And if you can grab any of his books or tapes, I would do so. But he used to say that you can get anything in life you want, providing you help enough other people get what they want. And that's largely what my attitude towards it, I know it's Peter's attitude towards going out there, simply seeing how many people uh, we can help, and if we can help somebody, then fantastic, stuff begins to flow back our way at some point in time. So just to put some numbers on this, because I am talking to accountants, so it's important that you understand the numbers. Here's a little case study, it's a very simple one. We've got 200 leads coming in, 50% conversion rate, making 100 sales. Every sale is worth $1,000, so turnover is about 100,000. No repeat business. If we do the sales program, the two days course, the immediate effect will be an increase in conversion rate. Uh, that will be the obvious thing that will happen because of the process and the ability to ask the right questions at the right time and lead somebody through a process. In this case, I've just uh, increased my conversion rate by 40% from 50 to 70, and you see a corresponding increase in sales revenue. That's what happens. But the real exciting stuff is when you get good at the sales skill and the marketing that goes with it, a simple, you, you begin to apply your sales skills to other areas of the sales pipeline. In other words, we begin to actually attract more leads. We get better at that through networking and advertising, all those sorts of things. We increase our conversion rate, we make more sales, we actually get more of the average dollar spend. We're able to look at um, upselling a bit into different products and services. And then obviously we get them to come back more often or refer clients. In this case, I've just taken a 10% across the board. And as you can see, just by increasing those things by 10%, we get a 46% increase in revenue. That's how I'm able to help some businesses grow from anywhere from 30 to 40% to you know, 200, 300%, depending on the size of the business, simply by looking at the profit drivers and increasing their sales and marketing within their business. So here are my 12 and a half points. Um, and that's all they are, they're just an idea, they're just guides. Uh, I stick to them as close as I can, uh, apart from always learning more and trying to improve my skills in this area. So that's something for you to have a think about and take away. And I guess at this point I've, I've sort of come to a conclusion and if you're interested in doing our two-day sales course, which I mentioned before, about 300 accountants have already been through that program, um, then it's just a matter of talking to Peter about that. 
and there really are probably two ways. One is Peter will, and with myself, will probably put on some. We will put on some uh, sales courses, and in, in certainly in some of the capital cities and maybe regional areas over the next 12, 18 months. Second way you can do it, and this is what a lot of firms opt to do, and we've had several firms do this, is that we can actually come to you, where we can do it within your location. We'd like to get about 20 to 24 people together, and uh, that can be a combination of uh, your staff as well as uh, clients. We often find by bringing your clients into this, they actually love you for it, and we give them an opportunity to increase their skills as well. So probably two ways that you can go about this, uh, but in the meantime, certainly uh, talk to Peter about both those options. Uh, the final thing I would say is uh, there is a little e-book on this website, the Trevor Marchant website, which if you want to go to that and download that, you can, and that'll give you some ideas in there about some of the things that I've been talking about today. So Peter, that's pretty much it for me. Okay, thanks Trevor. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation, and uh, hopefully, um, hopefully we've done the uh, transition there okay. Um, so thank you very much and obviously if you have any questions on any aspect of uh, professional sales training uh, courses for accountants, please contact us at ESS Biz Tools and uh, obviously if you uh, are interested in more information on ESS Biz Tools, we'd love to hear from you. Just a couple of other items. Uh, how do we keep accountants informed at ESS Biz Tools? Hopefully you are all in receipt of our uh, weekly uh, article we produce on Accountants Minute. If you are not and you would like to receive it, please send us an email, peter at ESSBizTools, and we'll uh, ensure that you receive those each, uh, each week. And the other uh, item we produce as far as keeping accountants informed is on a monthly basis we produce a business advisory news for accountants article looking at a contemporary uh, item relative to the challenges currently facing accountants in the marketplace. If you're interested in receiving that article and you don't currently receive it, please uh, send us an email and I'll make sure that you're included on the uh, distribution list. Upcoming webinars, uh, next week on Wednesday the 23rd, we have a webinar on government grants, business growth grant. It's a very popular grant, up to $20,000 on a 50% basis to basically undertake any activity which will potentially improve the business's performance. It's available for about 550 business types. It's not available for every type of business and we'll be happy to share with you how your clients can participate in those grants on Wednesday the 23rd. Please go to our website to register. The next uh, webinar in this series is on the 6th of October at 12 noon, and we're back to um, daylight saving then, so it's 12 noon Australian Eastern Standard Time and 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, for you in South Australia, Northern Territory and Western Australia, and I know we've got a few of you today, um, I'm sorry, we haven't got your times, but you basically got to adjust it by the difference between yourself and Australian Eastern Standard Time. And um, hopefully you can join us with Steve Owen from On The Level uh, HR for a human resources issue uh, for accountants, but, but with a particular emphasis on disk profiling. So also just a uh, separate pr uh, item to talk about on the uh, uh, 22nd of September, I'm presenting a uh, Smith Inc. Uh, webinar. It's uh, titled, uh, Do You Rate 10 Out of 10? It's available for uh, Smith Inc. Uh, subscribers, or you can go and uh, join for a one-off webinar if you wish. 22nd of September next week at 12 noon Australian Eastern Standard Time. Do you rate 10 out of 10? So thank you very much for uh, participating in this webinar today. 
please go onto our website and apply for a guest login so you can have 30 days viewing of ESS Biz Tools. And on behalf of uh, Trevor March and, and myself, thank you very much. If you do have any questions, no one sent us in any questions today. Uh, if you do have any questions on any of the matters that Trevor mentioned to you today in his uh, well-presented uh, presentation, please uh, send me an email, peter at essbiztools.com.au, and we'll get the reply back to you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Goodbye.